Welcome back to Queens of the Damned. Sadly, we're without Rachel for this episode, but Miranda and I will have plenty to talk about as we tell you what we found out about a couple of our favorite cults. I'll start off with one that is a little less known, and then Miranda will conclude with one we all know very well. Since there's so much more on this subject than two people can possibly cover, we invite you to tell us about your personal experiences with a crazy group mentality. It doesn't have to be a cult, but maybe you were in an insane work environment, a group of your friends did something together they would never have done alone, etc. Or maybe you did join a cult. We'd love to hear about it. So you can give us that info on Facebook, Twitter, or send us an email at qotdpodcast at gmail.com, and we may read your message at the beginning of the next episode. All right, so uh, (laughs) buckle up, kids, because this one is crazy. I chose Edmund Cruffield and the Brides of Christ Church, otherwise known as the Holy Rollers. I am going to post my sources on the blog later because I used so many articles to try to get a good sense of the story, mainly because there are so many rumors surrounding it that I wanted to kind of figure out what everyone was saying and kind of layer it on top of each other. So this guy, Edmund Crafield, comes to Portland in 1903, Portland, Oregon, not Maine. And the Wikipedia page was written by someone with a sense of humor. I don't know. Like, it's just this really awkwardly worded article. So they say, it is unclear how he came to Oregon. (laughs) He first appeared in Portland in 1903. (laughs) He he appeared there like a spaceship crash landing or something. So he worked for the Salvation Army for a while, but they were not holy enough for him think on that for a second. So he started the Brides of Christ Church. It's not really clear whether he gave them that name himself Mm -hmm. or if it kind of was something people called them after a while, but that's how the cult is known. Um, So a little information on the Brides of Christ Church. They're a cross between kind of Pentecostalists and Quakers. So they have that um, kind of outgoing service thing like the Pentecostalists, whole lot of shouting and rolling on the floor, which is what gave them their name. And they had very simple garments like the Quakers. They just wore a wrap, um, like a robe almost. And according to this one article, a thoroughly untrustworthy account says that Creffield claimed to need to have sex with the women in his cult on behalf of God so the next Jesus could be born. So he was trying to select a a new Mary to have this baby. Um, So the cult was mostly women after a while, and we'll go into that. We'll go into why that was a little bit later. But the article points out that what actually happened isn't quite as insulting to women. It doesn't assume they would just fall for something like mm-hmm. this out of the nature of women's stupidity or what, whatnot. So here's a statement that Crefield wrote about the church. He, he said, I mean, it was in some article he had written that it was about compromise, human sympathy, shrinking from persecutions, lowering God's standards a little, letting down the bars, and giving carnality a chance to creep in. Which, before you see a picture of this guy, if you just saw that statement, might make you like him a little (laughs) bit, but trust me, the rest of it is just way bad. (laughs) So... (laughs) So backtracking to how the cult started, so there's a lot of players in this whole catastrophe, which it did end in a catastrophe, of course. Backtracking to the beginning of the cult, this guy named O.V. Hurt lets Crefield use his house. You know, cults always live communally and give up their worldly belongings and whatnot. But this only lasted a few weeks because they started burning shit. They had a big bonfire outside, and they speculate that perhaps they also burnt the household pets, including a cat and a dog. But 
I don't know how much you can really say is true about this. There was a book written about it where they kind of unearth the facts and it's still pretty scary. So I'm going to try to differentiate because between what is rumor and what is absolutely true here. So after this whole fiasco, Ovi Hurt kicks the guy out of the house and a bunch of people in Corvallis, Oregon, this is where this takes place, a bunch of people in the community start getting real pissed. So let's go into why. As in most cults, those in the cult couldn't consort with non-believers at all. So either husbands and children joined the cult or they were completely ostracized and neglected. But while this life of, quote, self-denial and subjugation was routine for women back then, they were used to it. Like, that's what I do when I get married, right? It's perfect for women. The husbands would leave the cult because they weren't so used to being subservient. So what happened was Craftfield was left with mostly women in his cult except for one kind of cartoon-like henchman he had at his side. So this looks real good to the townspeople. And there were rumors that in favor of simplicity, they had to be naked all the time. So, yeah, there are some rumors going around. And these men in the town are beginning to feel cuckolded. And the brothers feel the need to protect their sisters from violation, whatnot, because... They think that Craftfield is having sex with all these women. Mm -hmm. And there's that rumor again about the next baby Jesus. So fast forward to January 1904. This group of men called the White Caps, which I found a reference to the KKK there. But other articles just said it was just the men of that town. So think what you will. Uh, They tar and feather Craftfield and his little henchmen to try to get him to leave town. But the next day, he shows up at the courthouse and he marries O.V. Hurt's daughter, Maude. So the guy who lent him the house and then kicked him out marries his daughter, who's a follower. And uh, press coverage noted that the groom smelled of recently removed tar and that his skin was bright red (laughs) from trying to scrub the tar off of him. Uh, So this guy has balls. Um, So the next month, he's charged with committing adultery with Maude's aunt. So his new bride's aunt. And he unhesitatingly admitted guilt, saying it was part of a vital, God-ordered purification ritual. Uh, I mean, no remorse whatsoever. So, back then, it's a crime to commit adultery, and he is sentenced to two years in prison, and he... Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. First, he disappears. There's a statewide manhunt for him, and while he's disappeared, several of these women in the group are committed to the state asylum because they're fasting and praying and just acting insane. Finally, in July, they find Craftfield... And he's under O.V. Hurt's house. He's been living there, eating God knows what. I think a couple of the of the uh, devotees have been feeding him, right? Uh, but he's oh like half starved, living in this pit he's dug under this house, right? They find him. They put him to trial. He goes. He goes to prison for two for seventeen months. And in 1906, so now we're two years later, he's getting out of jail. And he says he caused the San Francisco earthquake that happened that because he put a curse on, on all the infidels. All of his followers have gone back to their husbands. But when he gets out of jail, they go right back to him. And they move over to Waldport, which is a town on the Oregon coast on a patch of unimproved woodland. Now people are trying to actively assassinate him. Uh, They suspect that three men had purchased guns. At least three men Uh had separately tried or made plans to assassinate this guy. Um, So in April, this guy named Lewis Hartley, um, his relative, I can't remember if it's his wife or his sister, but her name was Cora. She's in the cold. Um, So he tries to assassinate Craftfield. But he uses the wrong bullets for the gun he has. So 
then Craftfield's starting to get scared, okay? So he goes to Seattle with his wife, Maud. And on May 7th, 1906, this guy named George Mitchell finds him and shoots him in the back of the head, or the back of the neck, actually, and kills him instantly. Um, There are a number of reasons that it's speculated that George Mitchell did not get charged for this crime. Uh, Witnesses testify that they told him that his sister, Esther, was Mm -hmm. supposed to be the new Mary that he was going to impregnate next. And so these reports allegedly drove him temporarily insane, which was the defense that he used. Um, Also, someone pointed out the unwritten law where basically it was an honor killing. Like, it's okay to go shoot this guy in the back of the head because you think your sister's been violated. And he was found not guilty after the jury deliberated for an hour and 15 minutes. So that's pretty quick. So Craftfield's dead, right? And his followers still believe that he's going to rise from the grave and that he's only temporarily dead. So two weeks later, Esther, the sister, um, who this was all about, is taken by her other brother, Fred, to reconcile with George. And she shakes hands with him. And then she shoots him in the back of the head as mm-hmm. well. Um, so, es- yeah, Esther's part of this cult, obviously. So she's been kind of brainwashed by this. And after she kills her brother, her dad hires the same lawyers to defend her who defended George for killing Craffield. At this point, it's quoted that police chief Charles Wappenstein said... I wish these Oregon people would kill each other on their own side of the river. Uh, (laughs) The media kind of sucked when it came to Esther. Everyone wanted this allegedly crazy woman who actually had some pseudo-legitimate reasons to do what she did to say like, oh, I did it because God told me to or whatever. But she allowed, said, look, Number one, the law didn't work when George killed Craftfield, so it's perfectly fine for me to do mm-hmm. what I did, because he admitted in court that he committed this murder. So everything's up for grabs. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, I- I'm okay, because Craftfield was a bad dude. <laughs> like, there's really no debating mm-hmm. that. But also, there's some autonomy with this woman that's being denied to her. And that's part of the second reason she said she did it, was that George destroyed Mm -hmm. her own honor by claiming that her honor had been destroyed by Craftfield. So, like, she didn't have any say over her reputation, and she just got tired of it. Now, Maud was kind of, uh, what's the word? She uh, colluded with Esther to commit this murder. She bought the gun that Esther used to kill her brother. Maud commits suicide while she's waiting in jail by having strychnine smuggled into her cell, and she takes an overdose of it. Meanwhile, Esther, she refuses to plead insanity, but she's found not guilty by reason of insanity anyway, and spends three years in an asylum. And after she gets out of the asylum, she commits suicide five years later the same way that Maude did, taking a massive dose of strychnine. So there's this one article, though, that speculated it may not be over because a lot of the members of the cult stayed in mm-hmm. that town, Waldport, kind of intermarrying with each other. Oh, no. So what? guess what happened in Waldport in 1975? Oh, yeah. You remember the Heaven's Gate cult? Bo and Peep started the Heaven's Gate cult and convinced 20 people to join it Mm. from Waldport, Oregon. And this was a very small town. So it's very likely that Mm -hmm. some former members or relatives of members of the Holy Rollers cult joined Heaven's Gate. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, like, that's not really mm-hmm. conspiracy theory either, because I think it was a town of, like, 700 people, and 100 of them were known to be related mm-hmm. to this cult. So then 20 of the yeah. people left wow. with Bo and Peep. Mm, it's not that unlikely. I didn't either. 
Uh-huh. So, yeah, I had no idea about that cult. I'd heard the term holy roller before. Um, and allegedly it was a pejorative term that the townspeople started mm-hmm. using to refer to them when they found out what they were doing during their services, that they were rolling around on the floor na- so allegedly naked, like asking for God's forgiveness. For it, I mean, it was it was for hours and hours, and allegedly they... Um, and they weren't allowed to practice their services in sa- inside town limits after a while because it was so loud. Like, and it would go on all night long. So it, I'll put a picture up on the blog since I have to put my sources up there anyway. But this guy, there's his mugshot, right? It's like a 1915 mugshot. And he oh my looks God. like an emaciated no, now version I have to look. of Merle Dixon from The Walking Dead. <laughs> I mean, he's scary. He is scary AF, and he, like, he's sitting there in this chair, and he's looking Mm -hmm. up at you underneath his eyelashes, like, that kind of textbook (laughs) psychopathic. It's it's crazy, and I don't know if it's the quality of the photo or what's going on there, but it is really nice. There's apparently a movie. Do you know that? I don't know what this is. I don't think this is actually about yeah. the Holy Rollers. I'd like to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, that term has kind of carried over into a a different use. I mean, you can use it to refer to any yeah. Bible-thumping sort of person in a very pejorative way. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really interested in, like, figuring out more about the women who were in the cult, because there were 15 to 20 of them. And I, my yeah. bet is that they wanted something bigger in their lives and they just i mean here's this made up thing yeah. well, okay and usually i want to be closer you, to god so in I'm almost going to every single this guy scenario says. the and, cult leaders are going after people but, who have serious problems in their lives and they're like oh i can fulfill all of your <laughs> your needs like i can solve all of your problems and everything will be fine you know so i'm sure that there was a lot of that going on yeah I think the funny thing here, too, is that the problem was this society they were living in. And so he he took advantage of that, knowingly or unknowingly. I'm sure eventually, if it didn't start out knowingly, it ended that way. But the problem was that society was such that they were all unsatisfied. So it was easy to prey on them, Mm -hmm. which is even scarier. Like, he's not just picking out individuals I still don't get who are unsatisfied. Why, I, I don't get why they're rolling suck, on the so. ground. Is it just... <sighs> okay. It's a it's a position of, like, submission yeah. and... Uh-huh. Like a dog, you know, like a dog will roll over and show its belly to you. Yeah. And also, I think they're they're kind of huh. experiencing a sort of That's extreme emotion while they're doing these prayers. So they're rolling yes. around. Some pretty good exercise there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had always... And that's yeah. funny because that term has always been like a part of my and life. And same with mine. Vaguely. I mean, but I never knew so where it came from. I and... went with the People's Temple, which is... I don't know. It's probably one of the most famous cults. It was led by Jim Jones and it was unofficially started in the 1950s in Indianapolis. And Jim Jones basically wanted to develop an ideal society that came that overcame a lot of social evils like poverty and racism. So in 1964, he was ordained. And in 1965, he believed that there was an upcoming nuclear apocalypse. And he relocated his group to California. And he found an agricultural settlement called Jonestown in 1974, where his congregation or group of people start to live. And he was greatly inspired by Marxist liberation theology, um, which basically mixes Christianity and Marxist socioeconomics. There's a lot of emphasis on a concern for the poor and also liberating the oppressed. Probably not. I don't think Marx would approve. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He's so like, sorry, bro, that's not what I meant. One um. of this cult, Terry O'Shea, um, she was 19 when Jones had approached her. And she said that a lot of the inhabitants of Jonestown were actually really kind and warm people. Um, and Jones was really passionate about civil rights. 
But she believed that it was his idealism that made him so dangerous to the world and to the people who followed him. And she escaped three weeks before the big, basically, finale of this cult. Yeah. So, um, she says that Jones was Talk extremely charismatic. Uh, and he tended to attract the people who needed help. You know, like I just said, it's always the people who are struggling and who can't find their place in the world or they have certain problems they're running away from. And that's exactly what he did. She says that Jones would beat the people in the congregation. She describes the story of a man who was accused of pedophilia and he beat him bloody with a hose. And he he also had designated lovers and she was one of them. And at one point he held a gun to her head and pressured her to say that she loved him. She didn't. She refused to. Um, yeah, I know. Terry O'Shea. <laughs> Go her. <Jeez>. Yeah. <laughs> What's this woman's name? So, because of the rumored financial fraud that was going on in Jonestown, and there were also rumors that he was mistreating the members, um, he moves the group to Ghana in 1977. So... He supposedly becomes more and more paranoid, and it's most likely due to the abuse of prescription medications. So while they are there, he has mass suicide practices with his people that he called White Knights, and he would, he apparently had speakers up around this place where they lived, and he would basically just say, like, you know, White Knights, White Knights, and um, everybody would know what to do. They would all run to the pavilion. And he would have hired guns that would surround them and um, pretend to shoot people with, like, rubber bullets. And then he would tell them to drink the Kool-Aid. And when they didn't die, when they didn't die after they drank the Kool-Aid, which they believed was poison, he'd comment on the fact that, oh, I can trust you now, and then just go to bed. And so they never really knew, like, if it was they were actually going to die that (laughs) night or if it was just a practice. And this happened very often. So some of the former members of Jonestown got a hold of the California Congressman Leo J. Ryan um, because they were afraid he was mistreating the people in the group. And so he goes down and he visits, and 16 people decide to leave with him. And Jim Jones is not happy about that. He does not allow people to leave. He actually blackmails people. Um, into staying. He doesn't allow children to leave either. So if adults find a way to leave, they have to leave their children. They don't have a choice. So he is absolutely furious that people leave with the congressman. So the congressman is murdered by um, some of the security guards that work for Jim Jones when he reaches the airport to travel back to the U.S. And shortly after that, on November 18th, 1987, the group, which is around 914 people, commit mass suicide by drinking cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, or, God, they said there was some other weird name for it. It was Kool-Aid. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. exactly Kool-Aid. Whatever. Like, there's some brand, yeah. like, off-brand something it But some were also killed was, by lethal injection. Yeah, I mean, everyone and knows And one-third of fine. the members who died were children. And Jones was found with a bullet wound in the head. They believed it was self-inflicted. And when the authorities did arrive, the bodies were in very severe stages of decay. Jones believed that if they all died together, they would be transported to another planet. Which was a theory he called translation. So that's why he wanted everybody... If they were going to go out, they were all going to go out together so that they would all be transported to this other planet. So the way that Terry O'Shea was able to escape was... There were severe financial problems going on with Jim Jones while he was in Ghana, and a lawyer had had come to talk to him about it, and he sent the, the lawyer away to just go deal with it. He just said, "I, you know what, you deal with it, you figure it out. And Terry was one of his, one of Jim Jones's secretaries at the time, and she convinced him to let her go with this lawyer because it'd be better for him to have someone who knew him rather than somebody who didn't know him dealing with the lawsuits. And so he allowed her to go, and when she got back to the U.S., she basically packed up, took off, and then changed her name and uh, until the FBI had found her. But that's how, yeah, that's how she managed 
to leave. Wow. So when the mass suicide happened, the children were killed first, and he had people in the, the wooded area around the pavilion with guns, <clears throat> and people who ran were shot and killed. And there was a very, very small number of people who managed to make it out. I think it was like probably like 14, no, not even 14. It was less than that. It was a really small number of people who were able to get out of there. I think so. Yeah. Didn't some the only reason that they the knew the that they there was dead. any lethal injection going on was because it was after they had arrived that they found like bodies with with the injection sites on them, which insinuates that they were people who did not want to do it. They were forced into it, um, which murder, not suicide. Mm -hmm. I thought that a lot of them did not want to do it and that um, like partially it was evidenced by there's a recording you can listen to it of mm -hmm. him like so he had this intercom right because if you're in a cult you gotta have a good old intercom to talk to people over mm -hmm. to like say good morning I'm the best like bow down and so he was you know doing his preacher leafing mm -hmm. and saying you got to take this because we're going to train yeah. send and all this stuff and I and thought cyanide was not an easy way to die isn't that painful okay oh i, I probably should have looked that painful, up if it's painful it's quick um um okay so you i don't know if this is true but you know like during those uh there's a lot of movies where like, the spy yeah. has a cyanide capsule, right, under his, like, gums or yeah. whatever, and then he can just bite it, bite down on it if he's going to be captured, mm -hmm. and then they die immediately. They, like, foam at the mouth and they yeah. just die. I don't know. So, I don't know if that's actually says, how cyanide works. It says on here it's that it's, like, prolonged. it's similar to suffocation right. because it cuts off the ability to utilize oxygen, the cell's ability to utilize oxygen. So, and I've heard, I mean, suffocation can be pretty bad. Okay. I would think so, yeah. That can yeah. take a while. Mm-hmm. Strangulation takes, like, two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's a long, the longest ten yeah. seconds of your life. Take that bad. times, what, 20-something, right? Yeah, well, and the worst part is that so, there were so many I don't kids. Know. It could, I mean, it could be not, one not third, nice. So, like, 300 yeah. children. I mean, that's just, that's just insane it's depressing the mass suicide was 1987 when did this happen again? yeah yeah and i mean i know you know oh, but like 87. this is where the whole okay. don't drink the kool-aid thing comes from yeah and, and in an in an interview terry o'shea had commented on that and, oh you yeah, know said how kind of how weird it is to hear that it's like such a cultural norm and like something that we just say all the time yeah well so drinking drinking the kool-aid we talk about it like uh drinking yeah. the kool-aid is buying into some crazy I ideology right that's what we that's the way we use it i was just saying it's really weird how someone's personal tragedy yeah. can turn into something yeah we well and it's like it's like a, a joke i mean i didn't know i like had no idea what basis. what it meant I mean, until, like, a few years ago. I, I mean, people don't even really talk about this that much, I feel like. Even though it's one of the most well-known ones, it doesn't really come up often, I guess. Oh. The last time it came up for me was I had a psychology okay. class in high school. Interesting. Um, and we mm -hmm. talked about Jonestown then, we talked about Heaven's Gate, you know. Uh-huh. I had some That's interesting, we never talked about But I got fascinated with I this stuff. I was taking psychology so. classes in high school. So I don't have a lot of exposure to cults. If we hadn't already done so much on Manson, I would have just done Manson. It was. There's a oh, new yeah. Manson no, documentary out. I don't know if you saw it. It came out a little while ago, but um, it's narrated by Rob Zombie, and it is so good. Mm The oh, final so words behind on my true crime is what it's documentaries. Called. There's a few but I want to see. It's a I whole just... different perspective on everything that happened and kind of plays with this idea like, was Manson trying to recruit a cult or was something else going on? It's actually really fascinating, so. 
oh, I don't remember the whole documentary. I will. I watched it. Or what? Once. What else? Did you <laughs> and think it came was out a while on? ago, so I don't remember. But I just remember thinking that it was put together really, really well. Um, I don't know. And they, yeah. Huh, right. I'll have to watch that one. I mean, I'm sure they never think of themselves as cults. They're right. a church. Well, I think that their whole group, their whole stance was that it was all people, Tex Watson you know, so. that was doing all of it, and that Charlie was just kind of he just had these people that wanted to hang out with mm. him, and then te- when Tex Watson came into the group, he was I mean, and I mean Tex Watson was crazy. Like most people will tell you that Tex Watson was crazy even before he got involved with Manson. So I think that's where a lot of their a lot of the basis is coming from is that it was actually Tex that like incited everything that was going on. It's nice to have different perspectives on stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really right. interesting to see. It's just you. Well, you do don't you have any like? Because we, we can talk minds, about like you know, um, kind of recommendations or something like that. You know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a couple of things that I want to see that. that involve cults. There's a movie called Starry mm-hmm. Eyes. It's fairly popular. I It's on my watch list, but I haven't seen it, so I can't really mm-hmm. talk about it. I don't know. I had a runner-up kind of cult mm-hmm. that I wanted to do, and it was um, the Arizona Sweat Lodge deaths. And it wasn't a cult per se, but this guy had convinced these people to go into a sweat lodge. Mm-hmm. For this oh my not recommendable amount of time, and four of them died because they went in and you know he was in there verbally mm-hmm. debasing them and saying you can't leave huh. and you can't get out and one of them passed out and it was just this awful. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure, but I think the guy got off mm-hmm. and did not face criminal. Char- well, he I th- I think he faced criminal mm-hmm. charges for it, but I don't think there is really anything they could get him on because right he only verbally told them you need to be in there they could have walked out if they wanted to and Mm. a couple people did bow out and got out but it it's hard to pin down when someone's psychologically manipulating someone else but they still have well in the whole term of cult and leave if they want kind of a kind of a hard one i guess It was a little bit of a misnomer because, I mean, that's not what mm-hmm. cult was. I mean, if you go back to, right. like, ancient Greece, a cult was, like, a sect of a certain god or goddess. It but I think, like, now it's kind of defined of as, like, thing we've you're cut off now. from communication with others and kind of, like, just taken. Kind of, or, or in, like, you can't leave. I probably should actually look up the definition, but I don't know. I think it's fun to try to construct yeah. a our kind of mm-hmm. layman's knowledge of what a cult is because it's hard for people to define. Like if you say cult, you can name a cult, but most people can't say what is a cult. So like what are what are the defining qualities? Usually I'm in a lot of, right it's not over everyone, but usually you have to give up your belongings and live communally. But I think what's actually going on behind that is a cult is anything that is considered mm-hmm. not religiously normal. <laughs> Which, <laughs> if you get into that, I mean, yeah. that's a little yeah. bit of a, um, a steep cliff there. <laughs> and it can also be entirely non You know, like what though. is I mean- normal? Man, to believe this whole what thing wasn't really all that religious. Yeah. Yeah. It was like an ideology. Like, wasn't it like that free love? It definitely. And peace it's it's a topic that seems to be coming back thing that in was going on horror movies lately. I mean, you have American Horror Story cult clearly, um, but I don't know. Did you see the Ritual on Netflix? Mm-hmm. Okay, that one is. Yeah, it's huge right not. now. I mean, it's... But I've heard uh, about it. I feel, yes. It feels like everyone is talking about it. It's fantastic. I, I was surprised that it was a Netflix movie. Because Netflix puts out some bad horror movies quite often, it seems like. I don't trust them anymore. But that one's really good. That one, it, it's not 100% <laughs> centered on a cult. I, well, I shouldn't say that. It is. It's about a cult. But... Yeah, I mean, it's hard to explain. There's a cult of people who worship, like, this really ancient <laughs> god. 
it's really creepy and it's it's very good. I would I would recommend it. I don't want to say much because it can easily give so much away. For some reason, there was a movie that also was on Netflix, Babysitter something. Was it called The Babysitter? Oh, The Babysitter. Mm. Yes, that is it. Well, that I don't one know. is I really good. It's actually it's really funny. It's not really. It's I mean it's kind of it's not really a cult. It's like a satanic cult. It's like this this group of kids. The babysitter is like a satanist, a satanist, whatever. Um, <laughs> I hate using that term <laughs> because it's so inaccurate. <laughs> but there's no other way to say it because that's what they I use. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, and she has this whole group of friends that come over and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, it seems like cults are coming back um, into horror movies. I think it's because of the conversation about true yeah, crime. Yeah, and I has think that so also like rampant emotions lately, like are have are... been extremely heightened over the years when it comes to ideologies. I think a lot a lot of it has to do with the election. It's been I can't I can't talk right now. I I got I've, I've gotten like no sleep these past 2 weeks and so I'm barely able to articulate myself at this point. <laughs> Whatever someone believes yeah. now, it seems yeah. like I think that has something to do with it to as the well. Extreme of what it is. Well, and it's kind of also yeah. about the way the masses are influenced by one central sort of charismatic, oh, that's yeah. arguable, character. I think the witch works too in a, a very subtle way. I think pretty. I think a lot of the most successful yeah. horror movies lately have been commenting on current social problems. That's why American Horror Story right. is so popular because that's all it does is comment on social problems. I mean, whether or not people know that's why they yeah. like it, it. Yeah, I agree. It, I agree. The, but also, why. like so, zombie movies that's, too. That's I know that's not a big doing. one that people think of, but like, yeah. No, so true. I just read a collection of stories, or sorry, stories, mm -hmm. essays, called We're All mm -hmm. Infected, and it's essays on The Walking Dead and the fate of the human, and it was talking about how relevant in so many different mm -hmm. ways that, and this was published when the first two seasons of The Walking Dead were out, that the, at least yeah. the TV show The Walking Dead is relevant to us, and Mm -hmm. You know, it's like about consumer culture. If you think of yeah. Dawn of the Dead, if you think, I mean, it takes place in a shopping mall. Come on. It's about like someone wrote an essay about it's about our reliance on fossil fuels because the characters huh. are constantly trying to find gas to put in the cars. And now there's no industry that produces fossil fuels. And like, yeah, I mean, there's just so many directions you can go with it. Current horror is very relevant to all well, of us. Well, people just don't sit and think about people it. People like don't it or understand think that it. horror it's there. can do anything except be scary. No, yeah, there's a stigma it surrounding is. the it genre for is. sure. It's still, I think it's getting better. I think it's getting better, but also there's think. some there's there anything, are problems with it. I need to fan culture Probably within. Not. Besides the ritual, I don't think I have anything else. Oh my god, I watched another Netflix movie called The uh, The Vault. On, it was don't watch it. <laughs> it was like I've never heard of that one. It wasn't. Okay, it wasn't good. awful. Good to know that when I'm flipping through, I'll like, be like, "This is wasn't junk. anything I'd ever watch again." It just kind of exists. Oh, it, it it's about these people who break into a bank and they're gonna rob this vault, and it's haunted. The vault is haunted. Yes. And the way it's described, it sounds kind of cool. Okay. <laughs> the way they, well, at least the way they write it. And then, yeah, it, to me, it just felt like, okay, so you checked off the checklist, but you did nothing beyond that. Boring. No. You need more. Right. We need so yeah. much more than that. You can't get away with that bad. nowadays. And then James Franco in it. Yeah. All right, well, do you have anything else? Blah. So, we are going to be doing oh. a giveaway soon. Mm, we I'm have bad not officially um, come up, really, with what the prompts are going to be or anything like that. 
but we have two really cool horror themed items one of them is a pin the other is a keychain that we would like to give away to you guys so keep your eyes peeled for that we're gonna try to figure it out as soon as possible but we're really excited to do it yeah they're, they're really pretty cool, cool. i'd keep them, them for myself so if i was willing they, to yeah but. i would love to have both of these items Make sure you follow us on Facebook. Oh, a couple people have unfollowed so us on Facebook, and I can't figure oh, out why. Like, jeez. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're boring. Oh, <laughs> right. That's so bad. Oh, you know we have lives. We don't do this for a living. Exactly. You're not seeing any Blue Apron commercials yeah. on this podcast. <laughs> we have decent microphones. That's about what you're gonna get. So, uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Donate to our Patreon. Give us a buck or whatever. We have a PayPal, though, for one-time mm -hmm. donations. I think that's a better option for one-time donations. So it's all QOTD, QOTD podcast. And look at our blog on WordPress. We have posted some interesting <laughs> things lately. If you want to see pictures of the creepy people we are talking about. Or um, I just recently posted a recap of our last... 10 episodes because we had not been present for a while because of the holidays and other stuffs. Uh, so I just did a recap of that and kind of did a little summary for fun. So you can go read that. It's uh, queensofthedamnedpodcast.wordpress.com. And if you have any, um, we still want to do a listener a listener episode where we tell your ghost <laughs> stories, but we haven't, we tried it once and we haven't gotten enough of them to do a really good one. So if you want to, if you had something creepy happen to you, go ahead and send us an email about it. Um, it is qotdpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you have a suggestion for an episode, or if you want to say hi or whatever and review us on iTunes, because it does help Bye. people find the podcast. <laughs> So we will see you <laughs> next time. Bye.